Welcome everyone to the V3 implementation call. Um, we appreciate you being here with us this morning. Today is September 8th. And we have um, not, not a huge agenda this morning, but we'll get through some great conversation. Uh, just as a reminder for housekeeping, this meeting is being recorded. We put these up on our website and also on our YouTube channel so that you can refer back to them as needed. We also consider these meetings conversations. So please take yourself off mute or use the chat feature when you want to comment, give a suggestion, provide your input, ask a question. These meetings become really valuable when we're able to have those good exchanges of ideas. All right, we are gonna go ahead and get started with the agenda. First up is Laurel Bader with a quick maintenance update. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to let everyone know that we will, will be doing a little bit of maintenance on um, Tuesday, September 21st, uh, the third Tuesday of the month. Uh, it will be server patching. There's a possibility of errors in submissions. Um, if you receive an error, please just resubmit. And that's all. If anyone has any questions about maintenance, uh, feel free to drop me an email. Uh, my email can be found on the website. Thanks. Any questions for Laurel? All right. Um, I am going to um, pause just for a minute. Um, Monet is going to put in the chat a link to a survey for the state data managers. We've got um, three questions concerning DEM files and, um, oh, I can't recall what the other question was. Monet, do you wanna come off mute and tell them what's on that survey that you're gonna put in the chat? We're asking about DEM files and facilities, how the facility lists are generated or populated. That's right, thank you. So if you if you haven't had a chance, if you're a state data manager and you haven't had a chance to respond to um, Monet's survey that she emailed out, go ahead and click on the link that she's gonna put in chat and fill that out. That'll just help us um, be able to close the gap in understanding some of those issues. Next on the agenda, do we have our ET3 partners with us this morning? Hi, Julianne, can you hear me? This is John. Yes, sure can, John. Okay, I uh, just wanna share my screen real quick. Okay, just real quick. Um, just a few um, items I, I just wanted to cover this morning. We're, um, we're ticking up pretty well um, when it comes to the receipt of uh, <clears throat> EPCR records, both historical and, uh, and uh, current year. I wanted to kind of give a different view this morning just to give people some perspective on some of the ways in which we're working behind the scenes. Um, what you're seeing here is really just a view of uh, how we've uh, accepted records, but also had to, in some cases, put them in categories. And so <clears throat> the top category here we have is called correct records. And all that means is that we successfully uh, not only uh, received them, but we also successfully ingest, in, ingested them into our um, uh, system of record uh, data store. So you can see there <clears throat> uh, the first column uh, that says sum of cumulative count of historical submission. That's all your historical records. Um, and we have a you know, specific date range for those that's, that's uh, prior to uh, COVID. Um, and that's the bulk of the records that we have. It's, it's about 6.4 million. And then we've got the current submission uh, all of this year, which is right around 4.1 uh, million. The other categories I just wanted to point out, there was a, uh, a period of time that we we were uh, considering a blackout period. Uh, we did receive some historical records that were uh, provided with uh, some e time stamp uh, dates uh, and times on them, which is uh, outside of the range that we were looking for. So there's both the blackout period and the COVID-19 date 
uh, that period that we are seeing those historical records uh, submitted. Uh, luckily, obviously, there's nothing in the current year that we're seeing. So those records uh, were put into a category called dropped records. And then there's the dropped records that are relating to invalid uh, values in, in the de-agency fields. And you can see there, uh, they're, they're right around uh, five, uh, 5.5 million in terms of the uh, amount, excuse me, 5.5, 5, 550,000 in terms of the, uh, the counts there. And we are addressing that uh, very active this week and next week uh, in terms of reaching out to those folks and seeing if uh, not only they can correct uh, their side of the uh, configuration of the agency uh, values, but also if there's a need to resubmit, uh, we are asking that that happen as well. So, so this kind of just gives a little context, uh, a little different than normal of what I would report. Uh, we do have about 15 remaining that have yet to onboard. Um, those we are uh, going to be uh, obviously uh, tracking and reaching out to. Uh, so uh, it's not a huge number, it's relatively low. Um, and then I've got about 140 active submitters. What this means is that they, these are uh, uh, submitters that uh, are active on a monthly basis and sending us data. We have some, some of the submitters that uh, have gaps in the submissions. And again, we'll be reaching out to them as well. So they're not counted in the 140. And uh, that's kind of where, uh, where we have, you know, those numbers uh, uh, pretty much uh, calculated. So these are our, our updates here from account perspective. Just a couple other things. I just want to let, let everyone know we're ready for Nemesis 3.5. Uh, we had a production release about a week ago, uh, which is supporting the, the Schematron. Uh, so we are ready in production for that. Obviously, there's a testing period of three months um, after everything has been documented and put out for the vendors to, to consume and use to, to modify their software. So that preparation is happening uh, as we speak. Uh, we've got an internal review of a, a new version of the data submission guide for 3.5. Uh, and once we have that internal review final, then we'll go ahead and make sure that gets posted out on the website. So development teams can look at the uh, Nemesis website and they will find uh, the version 3.5 documentation. I'll let Clay and his team uh, pretty much decide what date that's going to be. Um, however, it is coming, you know, very soon. So it's, it's pretty much imminent. Um, in terms of the issues we're tracking, yeah, there's obviously some gaps in historical data submission. So we are, uh, you know, seeing, seeing some of that. Uh, we also have in the key management area an ability now to clone a key. And the, the uh, nice thing about that is, is a close to followed by count. Uh, the nice thing about that is the ability to um, take, if you have quite a few IP addresses that you are using the whitelist for that key, as opposed to having to go ahead and key those in again, just so you, just, just because you might be adding a few more, you can clone the key and then go ahead and add the new ones. And that will allow for you to move forward uh, in terms of uh, getting a new key with, with new additional uh, IP addresses. So just wanted to uh, point out that this functionality is, is uh, in production and uh, it is a good feature. We've got one of our, our vendors who is testing this out now. Um, we are also resolving, I, I mentioned those drop records, so that, that activity is going. So, so that's pretty much uh, um, what updates that I have uh, you know, for for, for this meeting. So any questions or comments? Okay. All right. Uh, back to you, Julianne. All right. Thank you, John. Next on the agenda, Clay's going to go over some tools that we have available for monitoring um, the ILI increases that we're seeing. Yeah, thanks, Julianne. I I just thought it might be valuable for both the on the state side as well as the vendor side to walk through these products just again as as we're seeing this this incredible increase again in COVID related to the Delta variant. Just make sure that folks are aware of of um, the uh, uh, tools we have out. Uh, let me share my video. Sorry, I thought they I thought I turned that on. Uh, as we're just going through those resources and maybe also at the same time kind of showing you where we are, right? How, how the NEMSIS data is tracking with the, 
with the COVID variant and um, uh, maybe bringing you up to speed. Everyone is so busy. It's perhaps hard to take a look at EMS by the numbers on a regular basis. It's it's on the website. I'm I'm going to ask if um, if Laurie would be so kind as to as to go ahead and and I, I, I list the site for EMS by the numbers. And, and I'm going to walk through some of the slides, probably just the most kind of pertinent slides, and kind of show you perhaps how how you might be able to utilize these uh, EMS by the numbers, which is basically a PDF that's provided, and how that can be coupled with uh, dashboards that are on the on the NEMSIS website to track what's happening in regards to uh, uh, COVID and how that is affecting EMS. So let me just walk through these slides just real quickly. I'm just I'm um, I'm not going to do it in presentation mode. Just want to kind of describe these slides to you. So here's here's um, a, a kind of a foundational piece associated with EMS by the numbers. Here's how many records we receive over time. This is just a this is a recent poll of you can see over 13 days we received about three million records from across the country. <clears throat> uh, uh, the records. Are the submissions in green were accepted? Those in red were not. Monet works with the with the states and the vendors for those that weren't uh, uh, successfully submitted, and we hope that they're resubmitted. Uh, what's of note here, of course, is the is the submission lag that's there in the blue uh, uh, box on the lower part of the page. Um, this is why we have EMS by the numbers uh, not completely current, but hold it back for two weeks. Uh, you can see here, we receive about 75% of all the records that occur in any given day. In about 17 days is the, is the time frame for this 13 day period. It waxes and wanes between two weeks and a little bit over two weeks. Uh, so we hold back the data uh, for about two weeks to ensure we have a good representation of the, of the country in EMS by the numbers. We of course show control years 2018, 2019, and then 2020, and we're tracking in 2021. So our baseline data that we're using, 911 calls with um, EMS activations with patient contact, it's about 86 million records that are represented in these, in these timelines. So folks are familiar with this timeline, right? So the, uh, the two control years, 2018, 19 in blue and green, 2020, uh, where those are was the exceptional increases in the number, or excuse me, the percentage of, of uh, 911 calls where there was patient contact and the patient actually had influenza-like illness symptoms, um, ranging between 6% and as high as 12% of calls during, during that time period. And then of course, our uh, uh, the red line was the first announcement in 2020 of uh, community spread. The close of states is the shaded area, then Memorial Day and Labor Day are represented by the orange and the, and the aqua blue lines. So just, it was pretty indicative. We put those, on, those lines in in 2020 because it was indicative of, of, of when rises began again. Of course, with the variant, this has been somewhat different, right? The variant has had its own rise, right? Not necessarily associated with any, with any holiday or, um, a time of year where we might gather. This, of course, looks ominous, right, in that it still continued to has a positive slope. As I mentioned, this is two-week-old data, so this is probably into like the second to third week of August. If, if a state goes to the actual dashboard that they can access, right, for their state and, and, and at the national level, these data are much more current, right? They are as old as a week, uh, but are often more current than that. And I just wanted to bring this to people's attention because it is, it is heartening that we are just over this last week seeing what we hope is a leveling off of, um, of this increase in the number of 911 activations with patient contact with ILI. So we're, we're hopeful perhaps that we've reached a peak. We met with the CDC on Tuesday morning and they were talking about the possibility that they thought a, a peak might be coming, right? We might be, we might be curving over a peak and we were able to validate that with the EMS data at least. Um, so that's, that's hopeful. Um, if we go back to EMS by the numbers, we have added this slide 
just to track what's happening with kids. So zero to 12 years of age. And so those who are not yet uh, have, I do not have a vaccine available for this age group and with, and, um, with the, the noted increase in, in pediatric exposures with the Delta variant, we began tracking this. And you can see that there really is not a downturn yet in, in response to um, uh, kids with, with ILI symptoms and even much higher than it was in 2020. So that's, that remains concerning. I'll just walk down through some of these. We have been tracking cardiac arrest activations Folks who remember there was that incredible increase first reported in New York City about EMS coming across cardiac arrests. The same was true for sudden deaths, um, uh, the big increase in 2020, still, still higher than expected for 2021. And we do have a, a positive slope that just continues so that that remains concerning. Interestingly, uh, Injury-related activations has really dropped off uh, with the Delta variant, um, and so that's and so that's very interesting, right? Are people are people sheltering a little bit more? Are they are they staying home more? Not not as much risky activities going on. Um, clearly, not yet to the point that we saw with the shutdown of states, but uh, but an interesting downturn. Uh, the same thing is true for vehicular crashes, right? It's even a little bit below the 2020 time or um, uh, trend line for this uh, time of the year. Most, probably most concerning during this entire tracking process has been this no downward trend ever since the beginning of COVID in opioid related activations measured either by um, primary impression here indicating this call was related to opioid or by the measurement of, of uh, the use of naloxone. Um, you can see we still continue to track right along with the higher numbers that were present for uh, 2020. Alcohol-related activations also has been incredibly interesting, right? You see these peaks that just seem to appear in the baseline years. Those are kind of associated with, with pay periods. And, and so interestingly, that correlates with alcohol-related activations. This, this real precipitous drop-off that is occurring right now, I don't know that anybody can really explain what that is, or um, folks haven't had a good, a good uh, kind of hypothesis for why that's happening, but it's pretty, it's pretty dramatic. Um, offload times, offload times at hospital. So once EMS arrives, uh, the time it takes before they can turn over the patient to hospital personnel was just increasing at a at an incredible rate. We're we're seeing that kind of a kind of a switch over as well with the time frame. So we'll we'll see if that holds, and um, we'll get back to offload times the way the states can look at uh, specifically at very specific areas within within their state. Scene times, uh, there was this idea that scene times were increased because of the need to ensure that um, uh, EMS personnel were properly protected before entering a scene. That has dropped back down to what we would assume to be baseline periods in uh, 2018, 2019, because folks are getting more, more familiar with the process. So that's that's just a smattering of what's available in EMS by the numbers. Um, uh, there are more slides associated with that, so feel free to continue to use that. That's updated every single week and provided on the website. Other pieces related to this that are available are two other dashboards I just want to demonstrate real quickly for the states. There is, there is a hospital offload time or APOT time dashboard available just um, on the NEMSIS website under state reports. Uh, this is what it looks like. I've, I've hidden the time period so I can show you the entire year. It shows hot spots where it's taking a long time to offload a patient, right? So red indicates that over 10% of, of um, uh, EMS uh, arrivals to a hospital are requiring over 60 minutes before they can hand off the patient uh, to hospital personnel. Uh, so this is available and you can also look at all patients this way, or you can actually look at what we call priority one patients. 
They'd be patients that need to be handed off quickly. You can see what the times are for those types of patients. You can see this map is, is uh, only sparsely, uh, uh, sparsely populated, and that's because there needs to be a hospital in a zip code before it's reported on this dashboard. So each of those green areas, there is a hospital within, within that zip code area that is, is, is represented there. That same, that same dashboard can be used to look at turnaround times, right? So this is, this is the time once the patient is handed off, when is the back in service time and is it greater than 40 minutes is, I, I was there in red for a, a greater than 10% of all calls. So this, this is more, more populated, right? Because this is all EMS calls. But again, this provides the stay with the opportunity to look and see what's happening. The idea here was that uh, to decontaminate a, an ambulance, it, it uh, takes more time now after COVID. And, and, and so where are are the long turnaround times. So that's that's hopefully a valuable dashboard for each of the states. Feel free to use that. Then I just I also want to point out again what the future holds for us. Hopefully we're on a downturn, as I mentioned. Um, if not, right, the EMS COVID a resource reporting tool continues to be available on the NEMSIS website, and uh, there are few agencies now that are using it. But you can see that among those agencies that are using it, they are still reporting acute issues. So if you are, a, are a, an EMS data manager associated with any of these states, I hope that you are looking at this dashboard and able to report back to these agencies. I've, I've again blinded the agency name, their phone number and contact name for you to be able to contact and see what, what the issue is specifically that these agencies are facing within these states. This continues to be available. Feel free to publicize it to your agencies within your state that if this would bring some value to you. We did have one agency this week, I think, make a typo in their reported uh, uh, COVID death. So it shows 900 here. I think that's I think that's a typo where um, an agency added a number of zeros. So we're we're working through that, reaching out to the agency to get them to correct that data, but. This, this is another tool that can be incredibly valuable, I think, for the state. So again, I'll stop there. That's just a brief run through of uh, three dashboards that are available, one reporting survey, and then the, uh, uh, the weekly PDF of EMS by the numbers that's available for, for states. Any, any questions regarding any of the monitoring or tracking tools that we make available regarding COVID? Okay, okay, feel free to reach out if you have any questions, if there are modifications we can make, if there's, if there's other attributes of the, of the pandemic or the epidemic here in the, in the states that would be valuable for us to provide. We're, uh, we're open to continuing to make modifications as this is a very dynamic situation. So thank you. Thanks, Julianne. All right, thank you, Clem. Next on the agenda, we have Josh Legler. He's gonna go over some um, changes to the 3-5 mapping tool. Is that correct? Yes, thank All you, right. Julianne. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to make a couple of updates to um, the design of the uh, translation from Nemesis 3.5 to 3.4. So it's that, that translation down from 3.5 to 3.4. And these couple of changes are going to be in the area of the uh, incident and patient disposition. Um, we've not published these quite yet, uh, probably uh, just in the next day or so. I wanted to run them by all of you first, and uh, that gives us an opportunity to collect any feedback you may have for us. Uh, also be thinking about um, if you have seen anything in these translations that you think uh, could be improved. Uh, but haven't yet shared with the NEMSIS TAC, then we would invite you to, to do that, um, to share those thoughts. Okay, so let me show you um, what we're looking at uh, changing here. Um, the first change that we're gonna make in the mapping of uh, patient disposition from 3.5 to 3.4 has to do with uh, scenarios where uh, the patient is dead at scene or refused care, and another EMS unit transported the patient. So in 3.5, what that looks like is that patient contact was made 
and a patient was evaluated and care provided or support services provided. Um, and, and then we, uh, we look at if there's a reason for refusal or release, if there was a DNR or a pulsed, um, then we end up mapping to a dead at scene disposition. But the key uh, difference here is we're looking at transport disposition next and saying, um, in the current translation, what we say is if the patient was transported, whether it was by this EMS unit or another one, we're, we're mapping to a uh, dead at scene resuscitation attempted with transport. And then otherwise, if it was no transport, we were mapping to uh, the same thing without transport in 3-4. The change we're going to make here is how we're handling these scenarios where the patient was transported by another EMS unit. <clears throat> and instead of mapping that to a disposition that ends with with transport, we're actually going to map it to the one that ends with without transport. Uh, and the reasoning behind this is that if the person had been doing their report in 3.4 uh, and get to the point where they record the disposition, if their own unit did not do the transport, they most likely would have picked dead at scene uh, without transport um, because their unit didn't do the transport. Uh, so that's the difference there. And then we're applying that same difference uh, to patient uh, refusals um, so refused evaluation care with, without transport, um, just switching how we're translating those scenarios where the transport was done by a different EMS unit. So that's the first change we're going to make. The second change has to do with uh, scenarios where there was no patient contact or no patient found. So uh, this is, um, I think, well, just like the first one, I think these are a very small percentage of, of calls. Um, but uh, what we're looking at here is first the unit disposition in 3.5. If we get down to the point uh, where there was no patient contact, then uh, in the current um, translation, what we were doing is we were pretty much taking all um, uh, a bunch of these values and mapping them to um, a standby. Uh, so what we were looking at here is if they were canceled on scene, that was easy, canceled on scene, canceled prior to arrival, that was canceled prior to arrival. But if they had said no patient contact, then we ended up mapping to, generally speaking, a standby. Um, what we're going to do instead now is map, um, we're going to hold a few values to specific mappings, like if it was a non-patient transport, uh, that'll map over cleanly into 3-4. And if they specifically said incident support services provided, including standby, then that's going to map to a standby in 3.4. But if they had some of any of the other values for their crew disposition, we're going to go ahead and map it to a canceled on scene, no patient contact. If you really look into it, a lot of these values would be um, actually would not make sense in the real world, right? I mean, we're down to no patient contact for the unit disposition. And then to go ahead and say that they initiated and continued primary care or they assumed primary care from someone else. I mean, this is bad data at this point, but even if it's bad data, we have to map it one way or another. Uh, so these are going to map to a canceled on scene, no patient contact. Um, then the same will be true for no patient found, except that it's going to canceled on scene, no patient found. Um, and then for a non-patient incident, we're not making any changes to how that maps. So those are the two areas that uh, we're going to change in the translation. Uh, just a little bit of refinement here. Again, I think these are areas uh, where there's a small percentage of reports that fall into these buckets, but uh, trying to be as, um, as accurate as we can in the translations. Uh, that's what we've got. I welcome any questions on uh, what we're changing there. And then, as I said, also any additional feedback that any of you have been um, holding on to as you've looked at or used the translation resources, uh, we'd certainly welcome that at this time too. So any questions or uh, additional feedback? Okay, hey Josh, great. This is Samantha with oh, yes, go ahead. scroll back up to the top. I want to look through that one one more time real quick and see if I have a question about it. Yes, the first one here. Yeah. The transport by this unit versus another unit. Yes. I just wanted to walk through it in my head the way I would map it. it the patient support services provided is the one that um, I was thinking of that. 
uh, as you know, like an assist based off the the SEMSO extended definition. So I just wanted to make sure that flowed the way I'd expect. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so as currently designed, and as we are going to change it here this week. Uh, if they said patient support services provided and there was a DNR or a pulse, then we're going to end up with uh, one of these dead at scene uh, dispositions if we map it to three, four. So why wouldn't that be an assist though? It's like looking at the extended mm -hmm. definition that Ms. Semsa provided for it, it is support services could include extrication, carrying bags, or helping to move a patient. Okay, yeah, so saying maybe the support services provided um, even if the patient died on the scene, uh, really, maybe it should just map to a, um, a an assist type of right. disposition. Okay. I mean, yeah, I, that's that's just the thought that I had. Well, seeing that that one surprised me. Okay, yeah, thanks for that input. Mm -hmm. We'll look into that a little bit more. Sure. Other thoughts on Samantha's uh, suggestion or or others. Yeah, Josh, this is Clay. I'm just, I want to provide a shout out. I think, I think a lot of, of uh, these revisions that I think are more accurate and, and were valuable um, were um, made available to us uh, by Caitlin at Angel Track. So shout out to her for carefully going through this algorithm as well and looking for areas where we could improve it. Thank you, Caitlin. Yes, thanks, Clay. I forgot to uh, give the shout out to Caitlin for providing the feedback that initiated these changes. Um, in the chat, we had a question, how is dead at scene and resuscitation translated? Um, I was wondering, uh, uh, Sri, if you could, uh, if you have the ability to unmute and maybe explain that question a little more. Hey, uh, this is Sri from Florida. So. A uh, couple of weeks ago, we were going through uh, this translation with one of our agency, and they said they track a lot of uh, dead at scene and resuscitation reporting. And when we try to uh, reassess and try to map it back, we are unable to map it to specifically saying with any of those five dispositions, we are unable to explain coming back to patient dead at scene, resuscitation as attempted, or uh, SS, any of the SS. Got it, so I think you're talking about mapping from 3.4 to 3.5, is that right? Yes. Okay, yeah, so I've brought up the document now for going the opposite direction of, of what we were just talking about a minute ago. So going 3.4 to 3.5, and uh, talking about uh, these ones, the dead at scene, uh, with resuscitation attempted. So like these ones, okay. okay. So, um, so e disposition 27 and 3.5 would become patient contact made. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, resuscitation attempted e disposition 28, patient evaluation and care would be patient evaluated and care provided. Um, the crew disposition would uh, become uh, either back in service. Uh, oh, you're saying with resuscitation attempted. So that's these two. So initiated and continued primary care. And then the transport disposition, of course, would depend on whether they transport it or not. So transport by this crew or no transport. And um, so that's what it would end up uh, as in... Um, in 3.5, it would uh, essentially look a lot like a patient treated by this EMS, EMS unit sort of disposition because they had a patient, they evaluated the patient, they provided care, and they either transported or didn't transport the patient. I think if you mapped this back from 3.5 to 3.4, you probably wouldn't end up um, at this same spot of patient dead at scene resuscitation attempted. Um, so I think there's, uh, um, in 3.5, we, we lose a, a little bit of um, detail in, the, in that dead at scene piece um, that we would expect to find that detail in other elements in the data set. So for example, the final patient acuity would be dead. Um, and so that's how we would know that the patient was dead at the end of the call and, and the initial patient acuity uh, could, 
could be, you know, critical or could be dead. That means they were dead at the beginning of the call. So we'd be looking at those other elements. Okay, so we have to combine this position with some other elements to calculate that. Yeah, I think that's going to be your best route for like if you're trying to do some analysis on, uh, you know, how many calls you had where the patient was dead at either the beginning or the end of the call. And the other place where we had problem is assist agency public and unit. Yeah. Yeah, again, in the 3.4 to 3.5 translation, we've got a note down here at the bottom um, that, uh, oops, let's see, was that? Where am I thinking? Um, I thought I had a note, that there's a note somewhere saying that assists basically, um, that there's no where for them in 3.5. Uh, I, I can't remember where that note went. Let's see if I can find it quickly or not. Oh, I remember. It's in the 3.5 to 3.4 translation. So if you're mapping that direction, um, you'll never end up with a 3.4 value that's one of these assist values um, if you're mapping from 3.5 to 3.4. Now, maybe based on Samantha's feedback about the patient support services provided disposition, maybe there's something we need to do there that would um, end up mapping to one of these three, four values. These are essentially three values in three, four that really um, we, we don't find an equivalent combination in three, five for these. The reason these came up is because uh, we have some reports that we do on a yearly basis where we track this and... Uh, that's how we found out that we can't do this. Uh, right. If you're taking 3.5 data and trying to map it to 3.4 and then that, run your yeah. report, and you're going to end up having no calls with these dispositions. Yeah. And some agencies, so they are asking if they can retain e-disposition 12 in 3.5. Uh, yeah. mm. Okay. Yeah, the, the percentages uh, of calls with these particular dispositions is really small. It's like under a percent. Yeah, it is. Um, but... Yes. I, I went through the numbers and they are less than 4%, 5%. And that I've seen is like all combined is less than 1%, I understand. But mm -hmm. it seems these few agencies, they have reports specifically towards these. Right. And they want to continue to be able to continue report to, yeah. those even if they're rare. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, those, uh, are good questions. Um, cause we really don't have a way in three five that, that we'd, we would record one of these values that something was an agency assist, public assist, or unit assist. Um, it just, it breaks down differently in three five with those uh, four elements. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, for that input. Um, and then Anne had asked me um, where to find the translation uh, resources. So let me um, quickly show you that. Head to the NEMSIS website and go to technical resources and then um, mapping slash translation. Now, once you're there, you'll find the 3.4 to 3.5 and the 3.5 to 3.4 resources. Um, down below, you can also find the stuff going uh, to and from 3.3.4. And then way down there, you can find the stuff going to version two, uh, from version two to version three. Okay, other uh, input on the translations? Okay, so I will dig in a little more on the patient support services provided and assist um, dispositions. Uh, to see if there's some kind of a possibility of, of uh, getting some more fidelity in that part of the translation. Thanks everyone for the feedback today. Thank you, Josh. Next on the agenda is um, items from the Office of EMS. Eric, it is all you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, um, or morning, depending on where you are. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I just have uh, one thing today, and uh, that's to discuss the, um, the, not really discuss, just to make the same comment. Uh, one, uh, one of the state director's calls we have for COVID 
last week, early in the week, uh, one of the state directors brought up the uh, discussion of delaying 3.5, uh, the 3.5 rollout, 3.4. We discussed the, uh, and the way it was, it was the question was put out. It was almost like that had not been discussed. And I just want to reiterate that we have gathered the data about who has said they're going to do what when they want to do it. Um, we've talked about this with the data managers. We talked about this with the vendors. And we realize there's going to have to be some give on a timeline. Um, and we're just not sure how long that is. I keep saying I don't want to program for California. I don't want to program for Rhode Island. Somewhere in the middle is the right number. My agreement with the SEMSO and with the state directors is that while I take direction on um, what needs to be done with the technology side from the data managers, the overall policy issues, which this clearly falls into, uh, falls to the state directors. So until I have the opportunity, and I'm hoping that's before the November meeting in um, Reno, but uh, until I have the opportunity to take this to the state directors, we haven't set a timeline. I do want to ask them like what they think is appropriate. Um, I think everybody agrees if we pushed out to 2030, in uh, 2029, we'd be probably having the same discussion again with uh, with a few states. So, you know, there there's definitely a need to do this. Um, I recognize that everyone's getting crushed, and uh, the second round of COVID. And, and folks, I my personal editorial opinion, I don't think this is going away. We're we're dealing with a new normal, at least for the foreseeable future. So uh, we will be doing something in terms of 3.4 and 3.5. I suspect 3.5 will just let run its course like it is now with the dates because we don't have a hard everybody has to start but it seems like three four keeping it alive is the real issue and uh, that's what we'll discuss and come up with a solution so if anyone has any specific uh concerns or recommendations i'm happy to have them send me an email happy to listen to anybody's thoughts on the topic but uh, we will be taking that to the state directors as a part of uh our just general policy for NEMSIS burgeoning. Any questions on that? I understand that uh, the decision hasn't been made, but is there a timeline to make the decision? Yeah, as soon as I can get in front of the state directors. And uh, that's that's my, um, you know, I, I'm kind of at their mercy. and. I, I don't have a date. Um, I have talked to Dia Gainer, and uh, I will be uh, requesting uh, time. I, we have requested time at the November meeting. So I'd say the absolute latest is November, which seems to be um, too long uh, for a lot of folks. So if I can uh, get in front of them sooner at one of the regularly scheduled meetings, I will. But I need to get them when there's the, the bulk of the group there. And on the COVID call where we had the discussion last week, I think there are only about 14, 16 states represented at that point in time, um, as far as state directors go. So that wasn't the, the quorum for having that meeting. Thank you. But Jeff, I, I, let me let me back up. I, I think what I'm hearing is you want the decision sooner rather than later. It would make planning a little bit easier. And I'm already got customers who are crawling up my uh, back about gotcha. three, five and all that kind of stuff. I want to put it to bed too because it, it was it was kind of funny in all in all fairness and all honesty and I forget who was made the made the comment of last week, but they almost made it as if it, it was a little directed and it came across to me at least as you know hey look uh, you guys haven't done anything about this and you're not talking about it and I was like ooh on contrary we've had this conversation a couple times now um, so uh, you know there's a reality here and you're right we need to bring it to a head so. Let me talk to Dia and see the next opportunity I can get on there. I, I don't think this is a this is a huge debate. I think it's just a matter of timeline. Is this a six month thing? Is it a year thing? And then I think it's focused on three four because I know that there there are services and agencies and others that want to go to three five for various reasons. I don't want to hold them up, um, but uh, there are services that we don't want to turn off because we don't want to lose that data at a national level. So I hear you loud and clear, Jeff. Um, any other thoughts, comments, or concerns? Eric, this is I'm going to read for you a message from Ann in the chat. Uh, she says, when you mentioned the versioning timeline for something with a more frequent agile updates, we have discussed that. Is that being considered too? 
how can we change adapt more quickly? Yeah, that's a constant daily consideration. Um, we have those conversations with numerous people. In fact, we talk about that at our uh, our uh, internal SME kind of advisory board, I call them, and then our, our external SME advisory board. And uh, unfortunately, I don't want to say unfortunately, I think in, in my mind right now, the big ticket is we got to get to three to five and then how we version from that point on is what is what's really up for discussion. So, um, you know, the and we just had this conversation. I was just on a call with the National Registry earlier about uh, um, continued competencies and the, the new plan for how that'll go forward. And that'll require some change in thought processes and things, which really impacts you unless you're one of the, the directors or one of the people doing the tracking and policy things at your state. It really doesn't impact you a lot. But in reality, it's the same situation. It's a new way of doing business. It requires some, in some cases, maybe some statutory language changes, some business policy changes, some, some reworking of policies. And right now, everyone is just so slammed, but everybody recognizes that they want to move forward and need to move forward. So it's not just the, it's not just the nemesis side. I mean, we're really just putting um, a lot of eggs in the basket saying, hey, look, all these are high priority items and which one are we going to do first? Which one are we going to fund first? Because if you're not tracking how much money is being spent at the federal, state, or local level, none of us are going to have any coffers left at the end of next year if we have any left now. So not only is it, it's back to the cool government planning process, you, you, you want what you want, then you take what you can afford and you implement it in the timeline that's tolerable for everybody else. Um, it's, it's tricky. And uh, none of these decisions are going to get easier, folks. And I think you all know that. I'm preaching to the choir, and I apologize. But we're definitely going to move something. Um, as Jeff pointed out, we're going to move it as fast as we uh, we'll get you an answer just as fast as I can. I will reach out to Dia today um, to get it on the next available agenda. And then your comments about agility and moving forward, daily consideration. You know, how do we move this incrementally without you know, a complete revision, complete rewrite, rebuilding. These are all open questions for anybody. Eric, Mark in, in California makes the point of uh, that agencies that move before the state moves could be excluded from reporting to NIMSIS for a period of time. And we're, we're aware of that with every, with every revision. Yeah. And Mark, you're, you're spot on. Um, I, I, the only thing is I, I can't control what the agencies do and, and how the state manages that with the agencies and the agencies manage that with the state. Um, I don't wield that type of sword and I don't have the money to pay for everyone to do everything at once, although we keep trying. So, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I had an answer. I recognize that. I, I wish I had a clear answer and pathway forward for you. Thank you all. Be safe. Thank you, Eric. All right. Last item on the agenda is open forum. Are there any questions, comments, concerns that anyone li would like to bring before this group? Our next training will be State's Data Quality Workshop. Um, that will be October 5th. There will be a flyer and a notice going out on the Google group. So please share that with anybody in your state offices of EMS that would like to participate in that workshop. We'll be going over several tools to assess and improve data quality. Our next uh, V3 implementation call will be September 22nd, a couple of weeks away, same time, same place. Please let us know if there are items that you would like added to the agenda or brought up to this group for discussion. We are happy to um, receive any of those suggestions. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to be with us today and have a terrific day. Be safe, thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.